first thing I saw when I woke up this morning was a video about drone strikes in Afghanistan over the years. And it showed these young kids being interviewed after a drone strike. One in which a kid had his older brother killed, his nine-year-old brother killed, and now this kid who was probably around five or six years old was scared to even step outside of his house. And essentially it portrayed how we have given an entire generation of children overseas in places like Afghanistan PTSD, like literal trauma from the shit we have pulled off overseas in these ridiculous, unnecessary, incompetent strikes, completely reprehensible. The war machine is literally, literally the most evil thing that America does. Out of all of its policies, that takes the number one spot. Every libertarian, every liberty-loving, freedom-loving individual should be against this. They should be anti-war. Not just anti-war in the Middle East, but anti-war. Because for a government to engage in war, it will initiate violence against peaceful, innocent people. Anyways, this is Aaron Burr, and you're listening to the Free Thought Doctrine. One thing I want to start off saying is from my last podcast, I just need to put it on record again just to be clear, and I know my listeners are not dumb enough to take it this way what was said in the last podcast but I'll just say it to say it when I call for civil mass disobedience I am not asking anybody to break any laws duh right and I'm of course talking about peaceful measures I would never and never do advocate violence of any type so again I know uh, my listeners are smart enough to know this but I'll say it just to say it and there you go and that's that However, another point that I was thinking about when I went back and listened to that episode, if you guys recall, I had John on the show and we were discussing vaccine mandates and basically leadership in these red states of basically governors not having the balls to really do what needs to be done, right? You know, they call for lawsuits, and they speak tough on TV, and they wag their fingers, and that's pretty much it. I mean, in the last week since then, there's been a few governors that came out and did exactly that, but no one has had the the balls to actually do, to actually stand up for the people of their state, right? And John went on to say over and over again that it was his hope, right, his hope that the Supreme Court would end up falling on the side of the people, right? The That they would put a halt to any vaccine mandates. And it was his hope that this would be the way to resolve the problem, and that would be the quickest way to do it. And I kept pushing back on that. And I think I failed to say one, or to make one very clear point, although I did imply it, because when he's arguing for, you know, the court, the court, the hope, the hope, and all that, I think we're both arguing, or we're both hoping for the for two different outcomes. And I understand what he's saying. He's saying he's hoping that the court will make a decision, and this decision would happen fast enough so that the people will be protected in regards to their jobs and their livelihoods, regarding vaccine mandates, right? I get what he's saying there. But what I'm saying is that, you know, my hope is totally different. 
because his while his hope may even if it, even if his hope came true and the Supreme Court came through for him and all the people being affected by the vaccine mandates that still upholds a system that to me is not the goal I want, right? Like, my hope is that we decentralize, that we take away the power of the federal government, that we return the power to the states and to the people. And utilizing the court ain't going to do that. We're way past that at this point. So when he's like, I hope this, and I hope that, it's that's not what I'm hoping. Because utilizing a system, a corrupt system, to achieve justifiable means is just... Even, if that, even what I'm saying is, even if that did happen, even if he, even if the Supreme Court came through, it's still upholding a corrupt, broken system. And what I am advocating for is essentially to break it all up, right? My end goal and his end goal, my hope and his hope are two different things. Because yes, if the Supreme Court did come through and might relieve these people of this mandate and save their jobs, right? But what I'm saying is if we or if the governors and the people already turn their back on the federal government, then we don't have to wait or rely on hope or hope. You know, we don't have to wait or rely on anybody nor hope for that salvation to come through. Or what I was talking about was nullification federalism, localism, right? And essentially, nullification means null and void. These, what the governors should be doing in these so-called red states, these so-called Republican governors in these so-called red states, what they should be doing is getting their state legislatures together and passing laws essentially saying that they will null and void any ruling or law or statute coming down from the federal level in regards to vaccine mandates. That's what I mean by nullification, that they will ignore any rule, law, statute, ordinance, or whatever coming from the federal government, whether it be from the courts, whether it be from the executive, even the legislature. They simply ignore, null and void. That's what I'm saying. That's what I mean takes balls to do, right? To rally the people, to rally the state legislatures to pass such laws within the state or in the state. To even go as far to say that if federal authorities came to the state to enforce such laws that they would be arrested themselves if they even attempt to enforce such laws and dictums, right? That's what I'm saying. Because what I mean is it's really easy for these governors to act like the tough guy on TV wagging their finger and threatening lawsuits or, or, you know, doing lawsuits or whatever. But what they fail to understand, or what they do understand, but they fail to, or they, let's say, let's put it this way, they do understand, but they're pretending that they fail to understand, is that when they work within the constraints of the system and the rules they forget, or again, they pretend to forget that their opposition, in this case, the authoritarian left, does not play by those rules. They don't play by the rules. They don't give a shit about the Constitution. They long broke that shit a long time ago. 
So when you try to play within their rules, there's no, there's no fucking point. But again, they know this. They know this. But here's the thing is, rather than having the balls to come out and say these things, they play within the system, playing dumb, essentially, because they know that if they uphold the current system, that their jobs are comfortable, right? That there's no threat or challenge to them. That the system, although is corrupt, it will at least uphold them. Uh, you know, it will at least give them the power they have or think they have. And they know that if they actually came out and said the truth and had some balls and spoke against the system, that then their jobs would be taken away. See, it's only when they work within the system, even though they know that, even though they know that it don't work, that it's corrupt. But they know they could act tough, knowing that at the end of the day, their side's going to lose, but they personally aren't going to lose shit. And that's what I'm talking about. And that's the point I think I failed to make. I implied it, but I think it's the point I failed to clearly articulate. That, yes, it's easy for them to come out and, oh, we're going to do a lawsuit, this and that, and we're going to go to the Supreme Court. But in reality, they know two things. Either one, it's like yelling at windmills. There's that saying, right? And nothing's going to get done, but they'll be completely secure in their job. But hey, at least they played the part to care. Or two, on the very small chance that it, it, the lawsuits do come through, not only will they be hailed a hero, but they still uphold the system that empowers them and gives them power over you. Their jobs are safe no matter what, right? But like I said, the odds are they're going to lose because that's what always happens. It always trends in one direction, and that's more power and control. Consolidating power, that's what it always comes down to. Rarely, especially in the last 18 months, have you seen something come through for the side of liberty, for the cause of freedom. It just doesn't happen. And like I was saying in the last episode, a lot of people want that. It's just the truth. A lot of people want that. But that's why it's even more important that these governors and quote-unquote leaders stand up to the status quo. Because that's what it's really about, is overcoming the status quo. Like when I'm talking about the system, that's the status quo. Using the Supreme Court with your quote-unquote lawsuits, that's upholding the status quo. It takes real leadership to come out against the status quo. It takes real, genuine leadership to break through the status quo to break up the status quo. And frankly, we don't have any true leadership. We have none. There's been a leadership deficit in this country in every state in the so-called union for decades, decades upon decades, where they continue to uphold the status quo, the corrupt, broken system, where they've indoctrinated and propagandized generation after generation that this is the way it has to be. And these are the only methods to try to fix it, even though it, the whole thing is fixed. And even then, I'm not even advocating not using political means for political ends, because I still am. But I'm talking about using these political, using the political machinery in a different way rather than the same old, same old, same old. Like, let's use federalism. The framers gave us federalism, right? For these exact situations. They, these governors need to use it. And to be fair, 
federalism has been in play for the last 18 months. That's, there's no doubt about that. Like, I can't deny that. But that's also my point is let's continue to use federalism. But let's not use it when it's easy. Let's use it when it's hard. Because, you know, what I even what do I even mean by that? I mean, in the last 18 months, obviously, who, whoever your governor was made a huge difference in your life, whether you realize it or not. Someone living in Florida eight months ago had way more freedom than someone, say, living in San Francisco or New York. That's just a fact of life. It's just a reality. And in some places, that's still the case. In a lot of places, that's still the case. So that's federalism. That's federalism in play right there. And <laughs> the founders use a worse word to describe that. <laughs> but that's federalism, right? Like, each state basically got to dictate how much of the COVID regime was in place in their state, right? I don't think there's anywhere that was perfect, though. Even Florida was under the COVID regime for a while before DeSantis pulled them out of it. And then Texas only followed suit because of Florida, because Abbott didn't want to lose any points, if you will, right? It's all political. So I say again, let's use federalism. That is the key to standing up against these tyrannical mandates. Any tyrannical mandate coming from above, coming from the federal level. And that's where nullification, calling your state legislatures into session and getting bills passed to protect your citizens, frankly, whether they they want it or not, right? But I mean, 80 million people unvaccinated, there's probably a lot of people that don't want it. Let's just be real here. And I mean, people just don't, just don't get it. Like, I'm not fighting for people to not get vaccinated I'm vaccinated. I hope you get vaccinated. But to have a government forcibly inject something into someone against their will, that's, I'm sorry, that's just giving them way too much power. Because that is what it's all about at the end of the day, is how much power do they have over you? Can they deliberately violate your natural human rights? And a lot of people will say yes, obviously. And again, because that is right now the status quo. So that's what I mean. These leaders need to stand up to the status quo. Stand up for natural liberty. We're talking about natural negative liberty. Meaning that the government does not have the right to do things to you against your will. Without your consent. Especially libertarians where we believe the inherent right of self-ownership. That you and only you own your body. And therefore nobody, including the government, cannot dictate what happens to your body without your consent. But will these governors stand up to the status quo? I hope so. I don't see it happening. Granted, there are some things that have been out there in the news. I mean, just the other day there was a... I saw a story about how New Hampshire, at least one of the legislators over there, put forth or is talking about putting forth a bill for secession. I mean, that's... Sort of what I'm talking about, right? 
at least it it lends in that direction. It leans in that direction. I mean, there's been a lot of buzz with Sarah Silverman, right? Where she even, she's a Hollywood comedic liberal. And even she said that would it not make sense for the USA to break up into one, two, or three countries? She has a whole spiel on it, and it went viral. All right. So check that out. If you haven't heard it, granted, it's what it's what a lot of us have been saying for a long time. Or at least in the most recent times, for sure. I mean, think about it. When I spoke to John a few episodes back, he asked me, what's the difference between the state and in country, and I told them that a country is shared values, shared principles, shared heritage, shared history among the people, versus the state, which is the political ruling apparatus over the country, right? And the problem is too many people have been indoctrinated and propagandized since they were five years old when they entered government schools to conflate state and country. But if the main thing here is a shared culture that makes up a a country, let's just think about it for like a second, right? Do the people of Alabama have the same shared values and culture of the people of New Jersey? Or do the people of Georgia have the same shared values and shared culture of the people of New York? Do the people of San Francisco share the same culture, values, and history of the people of Whatever, Wyoming. I mean, I keep, I keep doing this all day. But my point is, what is the one thing forcibly keeping all this together? Because if, they, if all these people in the country don't have the same culture, the same values, the same history, or value the same things about their history then what is the one thing that is forcibly holding everything together? It's the feds, right? It's the only thing. So all I'm saying is how does it make sense that all these people that are completely different from each other, their communities are completely different, their their values, their principles, the parts of history that they each care about, Completely different. Irreconcilable differences. Or something like that, right? Is that what they say for marriages? It's time for a peaceful divorce. I know it's a hard concept for a lot of people to wrap their head around, but I'm not advocating for any sort of violence or war or nothing. I'm just a peaceful divorce separation maybe it's time that we went our separate ways decentralization that's what we mean returning power to the people returning power to the local level that's something that we should definitely focus on in the future because then it doesn't matter what mandate comes out of dc It doesn't matter what guidance the quote-unquote CDC gives. It's just up to the people. It's up to the local leadership. You're not being dictated by people that have completely different values than you, than your community, than your neighbors. And it's always easier to reform and to address or redress 
government at the local level, it's easier da- to go down to city council or drive, depending on you live, X amount of hours, but usually pretty low, to the capital rather than, say, driving from Sacramento to D.C. kind of thing, right? Or whatever. But the point is, you have more access to your local governments. And that's what counts. That's how you can... It's the local level that impacts you the most. And you impact your local level the most. It goes both ways. But when it comes to the national level, yeah, good luck. Good luck, people. Anyways, that's all I got for now. I have a lot more I can talk about, but I'll just leave it here for now. So hopefully you hung out till the end, and hopefully you got something out of this. And remember, you can reach me on Twitter. Change my handle, but you can get to it. It's at Aaron Burr Ancap on Twitter. Anyways, this is Aaron Burr, and you've been listening to the Free Thought Doctrine.